One thing we know for an absolute fact right now is so many people are going broke, guys. And when I saw this statistic about how much money people are paying in interest right now alone, like forget about all the other expenses we have in life. Forget about the high groceries, forget about the high rent, the high mortgage, all that stuff, okay? Just interest payments alone that people are paying right now Americans spent $1.1 trillion on interest payments in the last quarter, guys. So here's the problem, guys. Half of that spending is not on mortgages. So half of it is. Half of it is mortgage interest. And the other half is payments on personal interest payments is what the BEA calls it. And that includes all non-mortgage debt. And it's not that all of a sudden people are spending less on interest on their mortgage, it's that they have higher amounts of debt on other types of loans. Think credit card loans, personal loans, student loans, etc. Now, a lot of this is due to credit cards because credit card payments have jumped from about 15% on average uh, in, more, in interest payments all the way up to about 21.5% according to data from the New York Fed. And there's been a big spike in the amount of credit card and auto loan debt going into delinquency because of this. And then don't forget about the student loans, guys. So more than half of the interest that people are paying right now isn't even for a place to live. It's for your car. It's for your education. It's for just everyday living expenses now. And they basically go on to say here, if we didn't have 15 to 30 year rate fixed mortgages like we have in the United States, people would basically be screwed because you look at other countries, guys, most countries don't have this. They don't have this in Canada. They don't have it in the UK. They don't have it in Australia. Like those guys have to refinance their houses every two to five years in most cases. And they're just stuck with whatever the interest rate is at the time. So comparatively speaking, we're very lucky here in the US where you can literally lock in a 30 year rate and have it never move from there. Now, of course, a lot of this is because the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, right? And so the interest that people are paying on all forms of debt now is higher than it was before they started the interest rate hikes. And they think that 2024 is gonna show an historic year when it comes to household debt service, guys. We're gonna see people pay more in interest right now than people have ever paid in their entire lives. That's where we're headed at the moment. This is why I keep telling people you need to get out of debt. Like the other day when I named my top 10 things that people need to do to be in better shape for this coming recession, the number one thing, what did I say, guys? I said, get out of debt. And this is why, because when you have all these different types of debt, it sucks away such a large chunk of your monthly income. The more debt you have, the more money that you're making each month goes towards servicing that debt, and it makes it just harder and harder to get ahead. So, I mean, that's the first thing I actually did to better myself financially is just get out of that debt because, you know, it's, it just drags you down, man. Especially if you don't have a lot of money, it brings you down really fast. Here we have a house for sale for 2.6 million. It's a fairly new listing that they listed at the end of January. And take a look at what happens when you basically have the original owner of the house since 1953. This house was passed down to different family members in 2015, and now they're finally selling. And the property tax bill is still only $5,200 a year, which is kind of unbelievable because that's less than my property tax bill, and this house is supposedly worth 2.6 million. So over the long run, having a homestead exemption really does save you some money, but it's not as great as it's been promised to be, like we've talked about in previous videos. And you know, one interesting thing to talk about with this is even though people are spending record amounts of money on debt payments right now, I feel like that the Fed rate increases have actually done nothing for the economy, guys. Like when we look back and how much things have changed since it started, like you've seen some distress, right? We've seen the biggest change probably with commercial real estate. You know, that's suffering tremendously because of the higher interest rates. But the whole, the whole reason to raise these rates was to slow down the economy. But so far, it hasn't really worked, if you ask me, especially since the news keeps coming out with all these stories about how robust the economy is and how you know, everybody's still out spending money. You know, people are still buying houses. We still see home prices near record highs. We still see the stock market at record highs. So what gives, guys? Apparently, the rate hikes haven't done the job yet. That's, that's what I'm thinking. And the crazy thing is, or people are talking about when is the Fed going to cut rates, even though they actually haven't really raised rates high enough yet, because we still have a too robust of an economy, according to 
the mainstream. That's what we hear, right? But when you talk to Main Street, it's a different picture. So maybe that's the reason why they're thinking about cutting because they know that all this hocus pocus that we hear about is actually not true. Stories about how the economy is doing great are probably not actually valid and maybe the Fed knows this and that's why they're still looking to possibly cut rates sometime in 2024. But however, if they don't cut rates in 2024, that suggests that the economy actually is doing <laughs> uh, better than we might expect and also suggest that if they start cutting under those conditions, that inflation is gonna come roaring back, guys. Because if you ask me, if I was in charge of the Fed right now, interest rates would be over 7% for sure, maybe even over eight or nine, because I, th I don't think they're high enough. They haven't done the job you know, that they were set out to do. Has it increased unemployment meaningfully? No. Has it stopped people from buying homes? Sort of. I mean, we did have the worst home selling season in 2023 that we've had in like 25 years. So it's kind of working, but it's not working in the sense that it's not bringing the home prices down, right? Is it working on the stock market? Absolutely not. That reached all time highs. So it's not really impacting the economy the way that it was intended to so far. And I think this is just gonna be proof right here that the Fed is gonna screw this up, guys. No matter what, where they go from here, I think they're gonna screw this up because if they keep the rates higher for longer and they don't move anything right now, the economy is supposedly continuing to boom, but Main Street is hurting, then eventually that's gonna lead to a, probably a pretty big recession. Um, if they cut rates too early and they start cutting in 2024, when in fact uh, the economy is booming, what happens next? Inflation comes roaring back with a vengeance and they're gonna have to go back to even higher rate increases in the future just like they did back in the 80s. You would think they would try to learn from history, but no. Same thing with the jobs market. Like, are these rate increases having an impact on unemployment? Well, so far, not really. But if you saw my video yesterday, there's a lot of finagling that's going on in the unemployment system. Like there are people that should be unemployed that are still being held onto by their employers that are receiving assistance from companies that are paying them partial unemployment benefits. So go check that out, guys. I put that in the end of yesterday's video. There's stuff like that out there happening right now. And also, if you've been unemployed for more than a year, you don't count anymore. So there's a lot of finagling of the numbers that make it look better than it is. But the most recent ADP jobs report came out for February and they reported that employers added about 140,000 jobs in February, which is right around what economists were expecting. But increase in wages came to the slowest increase since we've seen since the middle of 2021. Not a good sign since things are more expensive than ever. So job openings actually are down quite a bit from the middle of 2023. The rate at which people are quitting their jobs is also slowing down, which is an indicator that the jobs market is not really doing as well as we've been told for the past several months. So maybe the lag effects of the Fed rate cuts are finally starting to have somewhat of an impact. We've seen it impact commercial real estate. Maybe as 2024 goes on, it will continue to impact the labor market more and more and eventually hit the housing market and the stock market. But that all depends. But you know, they like to talk about how in December and January, the economy added 700,000 new jobs, guys, but they don't talk about all the jobs lost and they don't talk about how many of those 700,000 jobs are Mickey Mouse jobs. Shout out to my friend, Jack Morgan. RLP, he, uh, he says I coined that term, so <laughs> I made that one up. And that's the thing, guys, like they say job openings are still higher than they were pre-pandemic right now, which is a sign that things are going well. But the, once again, a lot of them are Mickey Mouse jobs. Go look to see what jobs are available now. Go look and see how many people are working two and three jobs to just be able to make ends meet and pay all of their bills. And that confirms what I'm saying here. You know, I'm not saying it to be funny or make fun, but it's true. You know, it's true that people have to get a couple of these Mickey Mouse jobs to actually be equivalent to one good full-time job. And what I mean when I say Mickey Mouse job is you're not getting a lot of hours. The pay is not that good. There's probably no benefits because it's part-time. And was, that's a Mickey Mouse job. That's like a teenager job. That's like jobs I had when I was 16 years old, you know, entering the workforce. 
It's not good. And when they survey people, they say, you know, there is an uptick of people saying that they're concerned about the job environment. One of the concerns is that real incomes are not rising as quickly. So people are thinking to themselves, I definitely need to work. But then they're also hearing bad news about some big layoffs among a variety of companies. When they survey CEOs, one in five of them right now say they're looking to perform layoffs on some level. I think that's what's really gonna end up bringing things down. You know, if you see a lot of layoffs coming in the future, guys, that's gonna change this whole narrative that the economy is doing great. Because people don't have jobs, can't pay bills, can't make the house payment, etc. So one of the big mysteries right now with the labor market is if you see all these people getting laid off, how come you're not seeing the unemployment numbers spike up? And the answer is these people either, number one, already have a second job so they don't count as unemployed, or they don't have a second job but they get one of these Mickey Mouse jobs very quickly so they never actually had to stand in the unemployment line. So those are two very valid reasons of why you might not be seeing the unemployment numbers pick up right now. But I don't know guys, let me know what you think about the rate hikes. Personally, I think they should continue hiking rates until something does break in the economy because that would kind of force this reset that we actually need. And in the meantime, having higher rates rewards people who are saving money rather than out there spending it, you know, artificially juicing the economy. So the higher the rates, the more money people are likely to save because you're getting a higher return with that money just being saved. I mean, it's not rocket science, guys. The higher the interest rate goes in the bank, the more incentive you have to sock more away. It's that simple. At the same time, it's a deterrent to borrow money because you don't wanna pay that higher interest rate. So in order for it to turn around, we just need to see higher rates, but it's probably not gonna happen. And Jerome Powell over at the Fed is constantly being grilled about this. You know, when are the rate cuts gonna come, you know? And he keeps insisting that there's gonna be some rate cuts this year, but obviously we'll never say when. And that might end up actually not being true either, as we've heard. So people in the stock market, they're extremely worried about this right now because the whole uh, market right now reflects the fact that they're gonna see several rate cuts this year. And since there's talk that there might be no rate cuts this year, that would be very bad news for the stock market. A lot of people say that the stock market's in a bubble right now. I don't know a whole lot about the stock market, but I do know that it has hit all time highs. I've heard a lot of other people speak about this that know way more about it than I do. And pretty much the consensus is it is a bubble and there is a chance it can continue to go a little bit higher. But I think a lot of people agree that there's gonna be a pretty big crash at some point, at least on the level of 30%. This is what Jerome Powell has recently said. He goes, if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But nowhere in there does he say, for sure we're gonna cut rates this year. You never heard him say that. But then he goes on to say, but the economic outlook is uncertain and ongoing progress toward our 2% inflation objective is not assured. So people need to understand that there are no guarantees. There is no guarantee of a rate cut this year. It's probably very likely they're not gonna increase rates. I did see before that he said that a rate increase isn't off the table either if necessary. And one thing I keep mentioning over and over here on the channel is, why would the Fed cut rates if the economy is flourishing on the rates that we have right now? Okay, because that's what we're being told. We're being told that's what's happening. We're being told that the economy is stronger than it's ever been, and why on earth would you change the interest rates if that was the case? Because I can't think of one good reason why, except for the fact that it's crippling our uh, federal government's ability to uh, borrow more because the interest payments on the debt are so high. But a lot of people are still banking on a June rate cut, guys, and June's right around the corner. We'll find out. A couple more months to go. But a lot of people are saying that they believe that the wage growth is going to continue to go down, guys. So that's kind of the argument for inflation continuing to fall, is that wage growth is going to continue to go down. And that's not going to be a good thing for the average person out there. People need to continue to make more money for this economy to flourish. And if wage growth is going down, inflation might go down, but so are people's ability to purchase goods and services gonna to continue to go down with it. Now I saw another story recently about Bitcoin, and a lot of you guys know that I have purchased Bitcoin in the past, and I, I never sold my Bitcoin, guys. I, I kept the Bitcoin for anybody who's interested. I bought uh, Bitcoin, I bought a little Ethereum back at the end of 2020, I think it was, 
and never sold it. You know, I'm not, I'm not a trader. I'm not that kind of person. You know, I like to buy and hold my assets. That's, that's the type of investor I'm, I am. I am somebody who likes to hold for the long run. For somebody like me, buying gold and silver, buying real estate, buying Bitcoin is a good play because I plan on hanging on to those things for a long time and they'll tend to appreciate in value substantially by the time you want to sell it. I saw an interesting story about this because they're talking about how Bitcoin hit an all-time high of $69,210 on Tuesday, right? But because of inflation, actually, when you, when you adjust this number for inflation, it actually didn't hit an all-time high. So they like to talk about how inflation is going away, it's going down, and it's nothing to worry about. But even when you factor in the price of Bitcoin, when adjusted for inflation, it actually didn't hit an all-time high. So here's what the math is, okay? The last time that Bitcoin hit a record high was November 10th of 2021 of $68,982. But that number would actually be $76,544 in today's dollars when adjusted for inflation. So in other words, when Bitcoin hit its most recent peak, it was actually worth $7,334 less than it was in 2021 if you account for the actual buying power of the US dollar. And they say it's about a 9.6% difference, guys. So you're talking in the span of about a little over two years that our dollar has lost 9.6% of its purchasing power. And that's really the core of this story I wanted to get to because I know not everybody cares about Bitcoin, but some of you do. But just the fact that we have lost 9.6% of our purchasing power in the span of two years and a couple of months is pretty shocking, guys. That's the real evil of inflation right there. In case you never really understand how inflation works, that just means that your money today is literally worth 9.6% less than it was back at the end of 2021. And that's using the government's numbers to calculate this. If you go by real inflation, it could be a lot higher than that. It could be double digit territory, 15, 20% of the purchasing power we've likely lost when you look at it. Now, some people say that Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation and that uh, you know if you hang on to Bitcoin, then your money will be worth more in the end. That's why I bought it. You know, I didn't buy it as a hedge against inflation, but I bought it as a speculative investment thinking, well, I'm prepared for this to go to zero, but hopefully one day it's worth a million. You know, that was kind of like my idea with it. You know, I was okay with losing the money if it ended up going to zero. You know, it's a risk I was willing to take, essentially. So far, the risk has paid off. But they say that, no, 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 you know, it would have been better if you just uh, put your money into traditional boring portfolio in the stock market over the past few years and you would have got a better return than on Bitcoin. Well, I guess it depends on when you bought it because I think I bought mine for around 20 grand. And if it's worth in the high 60s now, I don't think I'll be getting a better return on that investment in the stock market. So it hardly depends on when you purchase Bitcoin. But you know, I try not to get uh, too wrapped up in these little what if scenarios. Oh, if you would have put the same amount of money in the stock market, you'd be this much further ahead or whatever. Like that's all should have, would have, could have stuff, guys. Like it doesn't matter what you should have, would have, could have done because you didn't do it. So it only matters what you did do and try to do better next time. That's all, that's how I see all of it. Just like I told you guys the other day, I don't care if I could have made more money putting you know, money in the stock market instead of investing in gold and silver and Bitcoin because I don't wanna take the chance. You know, I don't believe the stock market valuations are accurate where they are today and I'd rather hang on to my money in a safer investment and wait for it to come back down to earth and then start investing some of the money. That's just the approach that I choose to take right now. You don't have to, you can do whatever you want, it's your money. I just think sometimes people get confused, like when I say things here on the channel, like I'm telling you to do it, like I'm telling you what I'm doing, I'm giving you my opinions and thoughts on things. You don't have to agree with everything I say and you don't have to do everything that I do. Now, when it comes to real estate, I saw this interesting story that I actually agree with for once and it says, you know, home buyers should get pre-approved now before rates fall. Well. First of all, that's kind of true and kind of not, guys, because first of all, there's no guarantee of any rate cuts coming anytime soon, like we've talked about. And for most people right now, getting a mortgage, you're going to be paying 7% interest. So that's a fact of reality. But the argument for doing this is because we're right on the cusp of the spring housing market, and we're already starting to see the inventory start to rise pretty substantially in different places. Like Redfin's recent report showed that we have seen the largest uptick in inventory that we've seen in the last three years. So that's pretty substantial 
and more and more people are starting to come out of the woodwork and sell like we've been guessing was will happen here on the channel but the reason to get pre-approved right now for a mortgage even if you don't buy anything is just to have that pre-approval guys because i don't know if a lot of people understand you need to have that to make a, a serious offer on a property so even though interest rates are higher now People would say, well, I don't want to get pre-approved because I want to wait till the rates come down so I can get a better rate. Well, you're not locked into anything. You're not locked into any rate until you actually lock it in. When you're applying for the actual loan, you've already got the property and you go through the loan application, that's when you'll get to the point where you will actually lock in the rate that you're signing up for. So you don't have to worry about being locked into a rate until you're actually well into the home buying process, first of all. But by doing this, what it does is it gives you the ability to go shopping now. Like if you get pre-approved now, that usually lasts for about 90 days until you have to do another one. And it gives you the ability to go home shopping right now. So I'm not saying you should be buying a house right now, but people will. You're gonna see people go out there and buy in this spring housing market. That's when most people actually buy and the most sales and the most transactions take place. So. Just get your pre-approval, guys. It doesn't cost anything to get a pre-approval letter, and it puts you in a strong position to make an offer when you see a property you like. So just don't be scared when your realtor or your mortgage broker says you need to get pre-approved, because it's not a scary thing. You're not committing to anything at that point. You're just making it so you're in the position to be able to write a strong offer. And for anybody who needs a real estate agent, make sure to use my link down in the description below, guys. It's a completely free service I offer for you, and it helps the channel if you use it so if you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to the channel and if you don't want to wait for my next video to come out check out this one on the screen right over here and I'll see you in the next one